There's no magical wand that you wave. There's no golden rule that you follow. It's literally just a matter of taking action on your own idea and taking the first step. What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to the Struggle to Strength podcast, your source for real life application on how to turn your struggles into strengths in all things mind, muscle, and money. That was a phenomenal conversation, man. I really enjoyed yeah. that. Our guest today is Chris Joyce. And he's the man. Chris Joyce, um, you're the man, dude. Yeah. We learned about, yeah, like who should be an entrepreneur, how to do it, what are like the main things to, you know, successful business, all kinds of stuff. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. This was a phenomenal conversation. It was nonstop. He's got great energy. Um, really simplified the whole process. And he's right, dude. Like anybody can do this shit. Yeah. Any, like anybody can, if you have an idea that you've thought of and there's reasons that you're telling yourself for why you can't do it, why you shouldn't do it. Uh, Chris is going to smash all of those excuses right now in the next 30 minutes uh, and, and hopefully give you some motivation to get up and get moving and just get some momentum going. Cause that's really all it takes. So um, y'all stay tuned. Highly recommend you stay to the end of this episode. Cause Chris has some good things uh, some good final words of wisdom for us. And we will see y'all inside. The only way you can learn, yeah. man. I mean, messy action over anything, over inaction, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure you've experienced this. I mean, you know, looking at your LinkedIn profile, you've been CEO of like 30 different yeah. startups and companies. And I, I, I take it most of these were kind of a startup type, mind type uh, of business, right? Absolutely. I mean, most of them were, were starting from scratch or, or maybe at certain stages of funding, but almost always from scratch in terms of ideation. Yeah. So we always call it the roller coaster of awesomeness. <laughs> you know? We really do. Yeah. yeah and you know when, what? Learning how to ride that roller coaster and not stay too high on the high button now because we're, we're, we're going to have good stuff coming. Oh, we're going. Oh, we're, we're, we're rolling. Going. Yeah. Okay, we're good. In. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 This is where the good stuff comes in. But learning to ride that roller coaster, and we see this in business, whether it's, you know, your startup, whether it's yeah. just your employee life cycle, whether it's a fitness journey, you're learning a new skill, learning not to get too high in those highs and not to stay too low in those lows. After every peak comes a valley, after every valley comes a peak. If you're too bipolar emotional in that, you're never going to succeed because you learn in the valleys and you apply in the peaks. Yeah, but but it's even more than that, fundamentally on a base creation. So I always say to founders, you know, it, this is a roller coaster. And we always say it's a roller coaster of awesomeness. I steal that from a deal attorney from years ago because it was the most perfect description ever. And I always say this, you know, you're going to have these highs, these ups, these downs, but there's only one person that can go ahead and stop that damn ride. And it's not your business partner. It's not the government. It's not the economy. It's not anything else like that. The only person that can stop it is who, Josh? You. <laughs> and so long as you don't stop, so long as you don't stop it, what happens? You eventually get where you're going. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it, it's, or you get it's, somewhere. Yeah. Well, yeah. you'll get somewhere. Somewhere better. The foundation what's of the practice. What's the uh, the quote? Um, Alice in Wonderland quote. Oh, I saw one the other day. That was. It's probably not the one you're thinking, uh, but it was. Yeah, it's, it escaped I've, me. I've dreamt it's of at least six possible impossible things by before breakfast or something. Exactly. Yeah. It was a fun one that I that I just saw the other day. But yeah, it's, this is the this is the practice of practice. You know, like you could be doing something, and I just experienced this in my bodybuilding prep just a, a, you know this past few months. You could be doing something, and every day you're like, "Man, this is pointless. Why am I doing this? Like, this is pointless. Yep. I'm not. I'm not improving. I'm not getting any better." First off, pay attention to those things. Right. Right. Assess and take data to be able to reflect on and see why you're not improving or why you, or if maybe you are and you're just not seeing it, but right. then keep practicing. It's impossible to practice without progress. Yeah, but, but also think of this, and I'm glad you use bodybuilding as an example. Let's say you're starting off in bodybuilding. Let's say you're starting off hypertrophy, weight training, whatever it may be. Maybe I've coached powerlifting. I've done bodybuilding extensively over the years since I was like 16. Hell There's yeah. one great thing about it, and I think and it's a lot of what I learned was from that. You can absolutely be 
absolutely suck at doing weightlifting, weight training, bodybuilding in the beginning stages. So long as you keep doing it in terms of consistently, so long as you make efforts to learn, even if your form is bad, your form can get better. Even if your weights are low, so long as you do uh, larger uh, rep sets on them, so long as you just put the time in and effort, you get better. And then that better where you are at that stage leads to something more advanced, something to Mm -hmm. more advanced something more advanced and that's that's anything in life yeah how how important do you think taking care of your physical body is for entrepreneurship I think on a scale of one to 10, it's an 11 or 12. I mean, it's a requisite. I find that if I do not work out, uh, and I mean religiously, I get up in there very early mornings, my 14-year-old son, we lift uh, pretty damn consistently, that everything deteriorates. Uh, It literally clears everything up. It takes anxiety away, takes stress away. But also, if you do it first thing in the morning, no matter what happens that day, uh, whether it's good, bad, the ugly, you've already accomplished something. So I like starting off my day with accomplishment, with achievement. I have that right off the bat. And then that builds the momentum that starts the momentum to the rest of the day. And that's a big deal for me. I mean, it's literally a big deal because as you get older, less and less and less and less people work out. So, you know, you become more of a rarity and it's extremely important for me, especially as an entrepreneur. Do the hard things first, man. That's one of my, that's one of my things is like start the day with a win. And even, you know, something that while I was in my prep, um, I've been reflecting with my therapist on like what I learned about myself during this prep and how I'm changed, sure. how, I've di- how I've grown. And one of the things I've really uh, started noticing I appreciate is like the concept of doing things in a timely manner, doing things that create wins earlier on in the day yep. and taking care of myself and my environment. Dude, even just making your bed like nicely, yeah, not yeah, just yeah. throwing the covers over, but like make your bed nicely. Your environment makes a big difference. You do your workout in the morning, your cardio in the morning, whatever it is, you start your day with a win and that creates momentum. Um, but also like, like you're, you're doing prep right now. I'm assuming you're, you're getting stricter, stricter, stricter going for a contest. Am I correct or am I wrong? So I actually just competed, uh, on the 12th. Okay. So now we're so, in the reverse diet, which is gotcha. arguably the harder part. Yeah. yeah I don't yeah. have, I don't have an end goal, but I'm so excited about the opportunity for growth that I have right now that I'm like right back on plan into my structure. But as you were cutting, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the most boring thing in the world because you just do it. So what you did is you made that decision once. You made the decision to go after that contest. You didn't revisit it every damn day. You didn't revisit it every hour. It didn't matter if you felt great or you felt bad or it was cold outside or sunny or rainy or stormy. You just made that decision once. And I think that's something that a lot of would-be founders or even founders, entrepreneurs, they, they have a problem with because you shouldn't revisit visit that stuff all the time. You just made your decision. You then did it. Was it hard? Probably. Did it get harder at times? Yes. Maybe you you had a cheat here and there, but you stayed on the damn road to accomplish the end game. And that's a big deal. That's a hard lesson to learn. Yeah. I think um, there's definitely times, especially in bodybuilding prep, where like you're suffering so long, so hard for so long that, you know, things will come up and you, you get this feeling of like, there's always this this moment. I think everyone has it at least once in their prep. Um, yep. And granted, I never cheated in, in my yeah. prep. Like I, Good if job. I set my mind to something, I do it. I say Good I'm going to do it. I do it. Um, but there's always this moment I think that everyone goes through where they're like, why am I doing this? And you have to remind yeah. yourself why you're doing it. And you have to be strong in that why. You have to set the expectation and you have to align your effort with the expectation. So this is an interesting thing that I wanted to ask you about because you were mentioning, um, you know, the effort that goes into your health and fitness. Sure. This applies to fitness, business, startup culture, I'm sure. People who have trouble aligning their effort with their expectation. How do you see that play out in, in startup business culture? It, it, well, there's a couple things. I, I'm, I'm going to address a quick way to deal with it, and then I can do it, the more long-term vision of it, okay? Yeah. Yeah. So people are going to have the, the short-term um, emotional pops. You know, as you said, like, why am I doing this? The way that I get around that is, is if it's 5 a.m. or 4.30 in the morning, and it's 20 degrees out like it was today, you know, how, how do I bring myself to, you know, put the damn gear on and do it? Uh, literally, I lie to myself. I go, okay, well, let's just go ahead and knock out, you 
you know, four sets of chest and just call it a day. But always, always when that happens, the four sets leads to eight sets, leads to 12 sets, leads to, okay, now I can do my shoulders and tries and bring it in. And then I'm done. And before you know it, an hour's gone and the workout's done. So I literally just quote, I lie to myself. I lie to myself viciously when needed to be able to do it. So in terms of alignment and long-term vision, it's, it's really just, you know, my wife used to say it or still says a statement that, you know, discipline is remembering what you want. And that really is the case. It's, it's not going ahead and not feeling the pain. All human beings feel it. It's not feeling the doubt. All human beings feel it. It's just remembering the goal and taking that shit seriously. Because if you take the goal seriously, you're typically able to reach it. You may zigzag along the way, but there's always a way to reach the goal. Almost always there's a way to reach the goal. Yeah. What, when did you, what was your childhood like? And when did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Like, were you always like this or is this something that you learned? Yeah. Cause this on? is very, what you're saying is very entrepreneurial, like high achiever type mindset of, you know, I'll lie to myself. I'll go knock out four sets. There's a lot of people that would just go knock out four sets, but I can tell high achieving mindset. You're like, okay, well now I started, I got to finish strong. I got to run through the line. In answer to your question, the, the childhood wasn't wasn't rainbows and unicorns or anything like that. I mean, it was, definitely was not like that. But at the same time, I wasn't living, you know, uh, hand to mouth on the street type of thing. I grew up in an upper middle class family with an asshole stepfather um, that was, you know, kind of vicious when it came to mental torture. As as a uh, as a kid growing up, my first business was when I was six years old. I read a Spider Man comic and saw a business opportunity in the back to sell burpee seeds. Uh, so I sent in my five bucks. I got my 50 packs of burpee seeds, sold them for a buck a pack door to door on an Air Force base. And I was off to the races. You know, after that, I basically just did business, business, business. And it wasn't that I was necessarily wired for it. I just, I liked making money and I liked creating stuff. You know, that's really what it came down to. Mm-hmm. So that was your first business was selling seeds at Six years old, you said? Six years old. Man, yeah. I thought I was young. I was 13. <laughs> I started a, a car detailing business. Yeah. And, and again, just because I liked making money, I saw an opportunity. Yeah. I was, I think it was my my dad offered, uh, he wanted me to clean his car or something. And I bartered with him a little bit and sure. um, ended up doing a good job. And he was like, you can make some money doing this. So Definitely, um, definitely. So at such a young age, most kids, most kids are doing lemonade stands. At that at that age, you're you were thinking much higher level of. Uh, I, I don't know if I was thinking much higher level, or hey, I was reading a Spider Man comic and <laughs> way to make money, and that ad was written for you know a six year old maybe to hey make money sell seeds, and it was probably simple. I still remember the ad; it was a little one inch display ad or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I sent in my five bucks, got it, and it, it was just clicked. It just clicked. But for really from that point on, it was always business oriented. It wasn't yeah. sports uh, necessarily. It wasn't uh, even education, even though I did go to college and study and all that. Uh, it wasn't academia. It was really business. It was business hardwired almost from the very beginning. Yeah. Do you and, think like anybody can do that? Or do you think uh, you think like anybody in the world could, you know, could or maybe even should do that? Or do you think there's a certain type of person? I fundamentally believe two things. One, yes, certain people are wired for it. Maybe it's genetic. Maybe it's just the psychological that they had this this certain uh, stew of crap that just resulted in them doing business. One of the things that I say is if you come from an effed up family, you're qualified to be an entrepreneur. I have these 54 things of what qualifies you to be an entrepreneur. And the first thing is if you came from an effed up family, dude, you've experienced so much stuff, you're, you're able to become an entrepreneur. But having said that, Uh, You know, I really believe that if you ask anybody, and I've asked a lot of people, I'll ask if I'm in an Uber or I'm at a cash register, uh, if I'm in in the fast food lane or going in a retail store, whatever it may be, I start talking people up and I start talking about business. And so, I mean, it's it's, it's a self-interest type of thing. So I start talking with them and I literally ask them, you know, if you had an idea for a business, what would you start? Or if you had money for a business, what would you start? And almost always they come up 
up with something. Oh, I've always thought about this or, oh, I've always had this idea. And the acting on it is, is the thing that usually yes. keeps them from going. And, but if you ask people around, the vast majority of them have some idea, something to be able to get started, or at least they have a drive. Like I've always thought about going into business for myself. I've always wanted to go into business for myself in some way. Mm -hmm. So in your experience, what is it that usually holds people back? Because you started from a very young age with a high level of sense of urgency almost where you were like, here's an opportunity. Screw it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Whereas sure. a lot of people where humans are really good at talking themselves out of doing things, giving us reasons for why we shouldn't do things. And now your current uh, organization, Gusher, helps people overcome some of those boundaries, specifically financially. What is it that you see that mostly holds people back? This is the first excuse they say, and I say excuse because it's an excuse. They, uh -huh. they usually say that money is a barrier. If I had money to do it, I would do it. But once so that barrier funny. is removed, right, which is still uh, the vast majority of them don't start. So I tend to think of it as more of a fight for one's soul. And I'm going to make this kind of a, a deep little thing here, but I believe that everybody's got that little voice to do whatever. Maybe they wanted to be a writer. Maybe they want to be a surgeon. Maybe they want to start a business, whatever it may be. Uh, and it's almost in a way a fight for your soul to listen to that little voice, not the thousands of others that are shitting on it and crapping on it and poo-pooing it left and right. I think it's your duty as a human being to let that shit out, uh, let that voice out and to fill your opportunity. I think it's rough. And I think that's the fight that you have as a human is whether or not you're willing to go down the road to fulfill your opportunity or not. And that's it. That's what it comes down to. There's no magical wand that you wave. There's no golden rule that you follow. It's literally just a matter of taking action on your own idea and taking the first step. As, I've heard, as humbling as it sounds. I've heard from some people different things like, you know, think about what you liked when you were a kid, that sort of thing. Like if I, if I think back um, when I was kind of like seven and eighth grade, I started, uh, I went through like a, a period where I would make like home videos. Like I like sure. love doing that. Sure. Um, you know, and that's kind of like, uh, a, you know, a softball to like what, you know, if I had thought about that maybe later, I would have probably gotten into this earlier. Um, how do you think, cause a lot of people I think are just confused of what they're even into. So how, do you have any ways that you like, how do you find that voice if it, since it's been buried in adulthood? This is the thing. Once you're in adulthood, the clock starts ticking. So here's, here's the problem that you have. If you take a lot of time to figure out the perfect thing or the exact direction to go in or really what is your passion and go about doing it, which I'm not knocking. Okay. I believe that if you have that and there's something to pat your passion about, go for it. But I have found that passion comes after you invest the time in something and typically end up getting better at it. So how do you start? You just start, all right? I saw an interview with James Cameron, some guy from um, one of the entertainment shows was asking him, you know, I, I wanna start, I, I wanna make movies, how am I like you? He goes, just go fucking make movies. I mean, it was a wise. <laughs> And so he's like, how? I, he goes, just go fucking make movies. All right. When it comes to doing business or starting, you just start. It doesn't matter what. Because that, that invariably isn't going to be the, the, the place that you end up. It's a start. It's not an ending. So that is going to lead to something else. You've got videos. You're making videos. You've got a, a marketing company, a media company. But who's to say that that's not going to result in creating some asset that becomes a pump? That is yeah. some relationship that leads to somewhere else. Right. That scales up to be whatever yeah. your next dream is. Because, like, yeah. you know, that, that's yep. the way that I see it. It's just, it's a stepping stone. Everything's I, a stepping stone. Like right, you're just, yeah. you go through life and you just try shit. And you're like, if you're the type of person that will urgently act upon something, just an, a, like a, an urge that you have right. and try it, you will go through that experience. You'll take what you like from it and what you don't like from it. And then maybe you'll get distracted by something else. Oh, what's this? Maybe I want to try that. And you go through life you try different things before you know it, you've pieced them all together. They seem completely unrelated at the time, many yep. times. And then all of a sudden they mesh together and they right. create they the passion fuse. that you're talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. I th I've thought about that multiple times. It's like, it's like, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to go down this path. And that's exactly how I did this. I was like, this is something that I like. 
I'm not going to, I'm, I can't go get a job. It's like the most miserable thing for me ever. Like I have to work for myself. I'm just right. going to have to pick something. I don't know if it's perfect. I'm just going to go for it. So I started, you know, I started doing it. And then I was thinking like, if I figure out something else I want to do later, everything, all of the like content marketing and stuff that I've like gotten good at here will translate there. You know what I sure. mean? Like if I want to change what I'm doing, it's not like this is a waste of time. Um, and if you think back, I feel like, you know, once you get to, um, once you get the, the older you get, you kind of see those like things start to start to connect. Like when I was younger, I had a lot of random construction jobs, but now I'm in a position where I'm like invest in real estate and I like know how to work on my own houses. Exactly. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like that wasn't a waste of time. Now it's like, <laughs> yeah. really, it's like awesome to like have some of those skills now. So. Which is um, funny because some yeah. people would be like, what are you doing going to work in construction? Like you're way yeah. overqualified. Like it's a terrible job. Like, you know, and those people don't understand the connection. Yeah. But also those, th those people tend to, they tend to push down that voice and they have the whole world telling them to push down that voice. They have their teachers in school telling them from the time they enter school to push oh, down that voice. Yeah. They have their bosses telling them to push it. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't blame people for making that bad decision because for them, it's been a nibble that's been taking place on them forever. You know, so when my stepfather crapped on me one time for, and, and I'm not here to pump it up, but I went ahead and, and had this invention for something. He shit on it royally because he was an electrical engineer, absolutely destroyed me. Uh, but I, you know, my initial instinct was to say, fuck you, you know, and, and to really stick by my, my guns. And some people don't have that. Some people just have it where it's just pounded, pounded, pounded out of them, but they should know that it's able to, to be overcome. And it is actually very easy just by taking a step. I, it sounds crazy, but just by taking that step, they, they make a whole world of doors open that they didn't even see before that they thought was blocking them. The, the whole world starts to open up their path when they're on the right road and they start doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. It just does. I've seen it's a therapy for helping you open up and like realize that those doors are there and that they can be taken advantage of. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, I always feel like there's a bit of kind of guilt that holds people back too, because once you've consciously or unconsciously made up your mind that like you, you, you know, you can't do something. If you take that first step and then all of a sudden you're just like, on it and you're doing it there's a little bit maybe of a feeling like oh i'm a fucking idiot like why didn't i do this earlier you know what i'm saying oh my like, god yeah. oh my god I think there's a little bit of that that like scares people a little bit too where it's like so you oh, think joy scares people yeah like it's like well Some i've already given up so success. i might as well i don't want to be a i don't want to be a loser and an idiot so i might as well just be like i might as well just stick to having given up type of thing. You know I, I, mean? I, I agree. I think some people are afraid of success because they have, they're so used to failure that it's comfortable. Yeah. Like yeah. what if it does work? Oh shit, it is working. Like, what do I do? Like what is yeah. the success is so foreign to them. Yeah. Um, that's actually, I try, to, I try to not surround myself with those types of people. I apologize. Yeah. No, Only no, because I, I, I get it with the human condition, but I, I personally, and, and I, I love people, I get it, but I have no patience for that. You know, it's like, listen, if that's something where you can't fundamentally believe in yourself, or at least take a, a risk on yourself, then to me, the universe doesn't make sense. If you don't take a risk on yourself as an individual, as a human being, recognizing you have a limited amount of time on the face of this earth, then how can you even fucking exist in, is the way I look at it. 4,000 weeks, dude, memento mori. Like if that doesn't get you going, then I don't know what will. Yeah. You don't have a lot of time. And if, and if you're not going to believe in yourself, then who, like, who the hell is? Exactly. This is, this is something, speaking of the, the concept of being afraid of success and familiar with failure, and obviously I agree with you, the rule of five is real. Whoever you surround yourself with, you will become, so sure. continue to elevate your circle. And that's not a selfish thing. That's the self-preservation, that's self-improvement. Um, what I'm curious to learn from you, Chris, is do you think that you've learned more from your greatest success or your greatest failure and what was the success or failure and what was the lesson i'd say that they were almost one in the same so let me explain okay my greatest success was also my greatest failure 
All right. Okay. So I had a company w- which exploded. I mean, it, it was everywhere and it, it grew insanely. I mean, we were international growing everything else. But also there was a time when the market just imploded and, and really everything came to a, a, a grounding halt almost overnight. I mean, it was the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen. But, you know, the lessons that I learned from that, and, and it really, it, it's something that's simple. It's something we've touched on before but really is that that never giving up. I mean, I could sit here and pontificate and I can give the deal rules and I can tell, you know, if you're qualified as an entrepreneur and going through the ups and downs and everything else, but it always comes down to one simple thing. You just never give up. You never give up. You iterate. You never give up. You change. You never give up. You go for it. You never give up. You evolve. Uh, you know, you don't see a bird out there just because it's cold giving up and decide to freeze. I mean, it's just not part of their nature. With humans, humans, it, it just appears to be that that's part of certain people's nature, but it's really just a choice. And so long as you never give up and keep improving, I don't see how you don't achieve at least most or at least part of what you're doing, or at least to get to a place that makes you happy in some way. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And uh, it, it, it's hard sometimes to keep going when you feel like, especially what we talked about earlier, feels like nothing's working. It feels like I'm not making any progress. So do you do you keep a, a journal or notes or somehow reflect on your progress or the lessons that you've learned in, with any sort of regularity? Sure. If you can't measure it, you can't correct it. You know, you track what you change. <laughs> Uh, you know, I use something on my phone that's like I use Google Keep to, to do it. And so everything from thought processes to literally numbers uh, in terms of metrics that I do. Uh, but am I sitting here trying to make every day as, quote unquote, efficient as humanly possible? I used to do that. All right. But I found that that really painting very broad strokes for me works better. So I go for my annual number. All right. I've got my annual number. Yep. I go for my family metric. There's a family metric. Yeah. And then I go for my health. There, there are certain physical things that I do. So business, family, and health. And that's my main three goals that I look at and I revisit regularly. Because honestly, what, what the hell else can you measure? I can sit there and get into minutia on absolutely everything. I can sit there and analyze marketing uh, with a fine tooth comb and still not be able to find patterns in it. Uh, but if you're able to look at it from a little bit step back on an annualized basis, well, you know, as a bodybuilder, you see a lot of growth after a year. Uh, you may not see it after a week or two or a month or two or three, but a year you can dramatically change. And same thing with businesses same thing with family you see change typically on that scale yeah and i think most people most people overestimate what they can do in a short period of time like a couple of weeks or a couple of months and they underestimate what they can do in a year and they also tend to overestimate the significance of small improvements feeling like they have to do it all they have to make go all in on their business and, you know, dedicate their entire lives to it. And they end up losing the other boiling pots of your uh, family and your fitness, for example, because they're so laser focused on the finance portion or the business portion. Um, but man, even just a little 1% improvement every day over the course of a year, that's massive. You know, 1% improvement every, every two weeks or three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Real. Everybody uses that one a day. Yeah. Over every hundred days, you're doubling, but I mean, that, yeah. that's crazy fast. Well, people probably see companies like yours that had, uh, you know, this massive growth and they want that, but massive growth isn't always a good thing. Yeah. You know, because then there's an expectation like, you know, Travis makes this uh, um, sort of analogy a lot, like and everything that goes up comes down. Sure. Like the faster it goes up, usually the faster it's going to come down. Absolutely. So slow and steady really does win the race. Do you, especially with people starting a business um, in regardless of the industry, do you find that there is almost like a sweet spot for growth? that you tend to sort of aim for? I'm good from the zero to 50 million scale. Anything above 50 million, I get bored. So it literally, <laughs> the ra- I, 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 seriously, so the rapid stages of growth, um, I like, but I also like the fog of war. I like creating something out of nothing. Uh, it's very difficult to standardize the startup process at ideation. There are certain things that you can do, certain templates you can follow, 
uh, but they almost never hold up there in terms of longer term. So in the beginning stages, I just like it because that's that's the most where you can create. That's the most impact you have on a business. And it, it, even as you grow further, you can't have the amount of impact uh, that you have at the beginning stages. That's the place that you set your DNA and you set the tone for how you're going about it. Um, and that's what I love. I love the beginning stages of starting yeah. businesses. Yeah, that is the fun part. It's fun. That and it's the also the painful part. part. And it's also the ugly part. <laughs> Let's not forget that. That's a lot of trial and error in that in yeah. that phase. It's a lot of figuring out who you are, what your business is, how your business operates, your values, uh, your your standard operating procedures and all that. And yeah. uh, you know, man, that's that's a really exciting part of the business. And then it's just fine tuning after that, which is, you know. Boring. It's For me. Boring. You know, yeah. things start to kind of run themselves a little bit. And um, but yeah, it's it's very interesting. What would you say uh, are some of the most important things in that in the early stages of that business to ensure success and limit just the headaches that you're going to experience? Because your approach is just fucking do it. <laughs> well, well, there, there's two things I think that are extremely important and, and like fundamentally uh, to the creation of any company. Number one, the founder has to do, must absolutely do sales validation. All right. You cannot outsource that. You can't have it as just something as a marketing side. Even if you're creating a technical company, you have to be sales validating that from the very beginning, from the time of ideation. Why do you do that? Because that's going to help you create a better product that you develop down the line. It's not going to, it's, it's not something uh, that you want to start after you have a product created. It's not something that you want to start, you know, six months, 12 months down to it. You want to start it from day one. Okay, that's number one. Founder has to do sales validation, even if they are the worst salesperson in the world, even if it is not uh, their strength, even if they have a better salesperson partner, you have to, as founder, if you're a co-founder, you have to sales validate. You have to get on the phone. You have to get out there. You have to talk to people, whatever the hell it may be. You've got to do that because the amount of, of learning uh, in such a short period of time that you will get from doing that is immense. It's absolutely immense. And the other thing is when you're doing that, people don't realize this, the prospects that you're, you're contacting, the potential customers, whatever it may be, you are founders. So even if you suck as a salesperson, you still know a million times more than they do. And believe it or not, you're typically put up on a pedestal. You are a different form of God to them unless they're a founder. So mm -hmm. it's something that, that has a huge impact. The second thing I'd say, which is... It, almost almost as important is that whether you're a tech company, whether you're a medical device company, whether you're a manufacturing company, whether you're a video service company, it doesn't matter what type of company you are, at your, your, your primary function is that you are a marketing company in the beginning stages, no matter what type of business you are. Marketing and sales cannot be an afterthought. Marketing must be hardwired into your DNA from the very beginning, so much so that you may not even have a product, but you can test market it without having it. You can test get to get sales without even having a product developed from the very beginning stages if you do it right. So yeah. marketing, 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 marketing uh, from the very beginning stage, from a point of ideation. Because if nobody's going to nibble at it, if nobody's going to buy it from the very beginning, you damn well better, better find out quickly. Very yeah, well, quickly. Yeah, Travis loved that one. <laughs> Boom. Boom. We're going to do a little bomb drop uh you know, sound animation, bite. yeah, sound bite. yeah. That, I, I agree with that. So spot on. That's and and you know what? Even in the later stages of my business, I still do that. If we roll out a new product, of course I'm going to test it first. I'm not going to go about building something if that's no one's going to buy. Of course, I'm going to I'm going to put marketing out and I'm going to see who who bites on it. And if enough people bite on it, then yeah, okay, I'll make it. We've done deals. People don't believe me when I say this. We've done deals with some very large companies: Walmart, uh, Target. Uh, CVS, um, Publix, um, what's the other, Wegmans, all these big different different things without ever having the product. 
And when I say without having, I mean literally without having the product. So we'd contact the buyers, we'd send them you know, their sell sheet and, and whatever it is. Little did they know that was just a version of a pitch we were testing. They go ahead and say, oh yeah, we're doing a reset of this category uh, in nine months. Why don't we set up, we're taking buyer's appointments, let's meet with you six months from now. Yeah, in those six months we're scrambling, we're creating an MVP, doing whatever. We show up you know, there with you know, a sample type of a product in that amount of time, but we don't develop it beforehand. Until we have buyers, until we until we have buy sign, you know. Yeah, that'd be the worst thing in the world. Spend so much time and money developing something, and then find out no one wants it. Um, you, you know how Last many company companies I worked I like at? It? Yeah, I bet a lot of people do that. O- almost all the venture capital co- funded companies. Have you ever heard of product market fit? Those are the ones that get money ahead of time without having done that. There should be no such thing as product market fit when you create a company. It no. should yeah, be done last, right from the very beginning. Last company I worked at, that was. That was the case um, and why yeah. they went bankrupt, in my opinion, is just like we started, you know, I, I got brought on one of like the first four people at the company. We started doing sales and we're just like, dude, the 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 client, the industry that we're selling to just doesn't like this product. And that's <laughs> basically it. Like there's nothing else to say here. Now, let me ask you a question, Travis. I mean, if you were creating that company from the very beginning, okay, and you didn't have a product figured out, but you're doing this pitch and they're saying they don't like it. They don't like it. Couldn't you have gone ahead and found out what they did like? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Couldn't you have then modified or changed your product development to give them the crack if they wanted crack? You know, literally, you could have changed it. Yeah. 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 I mean, this example, so it was in the, the California cannabis industry, and it was like a, like a herbal vaporizer, like technology. Yeah. Um, and it was, an, it was so a, it's an amazing product. Like it worked. It's, it's a better product it's one of the best, like probably made, um, right. but it was made by, it was, d- you know, developed by people who are not stoners. Like they just don't <laughs> know the industry. And at the end of the day, you can like try to change things or market to different people, but your clients are stoners. Right. Period. And yeah. like, that's it. Yeah. They, they don't understand what those people want. They designed it in a way that just doesn't work with them. And it's, that's that. And then the company's done. After and if the founder was hanging out with 30, 40, 50 stoners ahead of time, yeah. he would have known that. He would have, <laughs> that. He would have seen a bigger opportunity probably. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. And then if you had the marketing team there with stoner, they would have talked the lingo and, and knew how to penetrate yeah. that market. You know, that, that's what you do. You got, yeah, that's what, I don't know. I definitely learned something from that, which is like, you know, it starts with who are the people that you're selling to? Not who do you think they are, but who are yeah. they? And yeah. what do they want? <laughs> right. You know? And it's crazy how simple that sounds. But, and how many, how many, I think that's probably, I don't know. What do you think? Is that like the number one thing that like kills companies? Uh, in my opinion, yeah. I, I mean, I absolutely. Because if you if you do a Google search and you run product market fit, uh, and you'll see, I mean, literally almost every VC funded company out there, they keep talking about product market fit. Y Combinator, product market fit. Um, whoever the boy is in Colorado, I can't remember his name, uh, th- their incubator or accelerator. It's, they always talk about product market fit. And I'm sitting there going, you, you people are forming companies ass backwards. You, you don't do it that way. You create a company after talking to the market, after yeah. getting the market involved, after, you know, coming up with maybe you have an initial idea, but you're, you're introducing it to them and getting their feedback, which then drives development, not the other way around. You don't force yeah. that down their throat. You know, this isn't like Ford uh, where you're creating a car and you're going to dominate the market and tell that market what to do. Or you know, that Apple. happens once in a lifetime. You know? Apple. It, Apple's it, like that too. Right? Apple's yeah. like that too. But this makes, when you really think about it, this makes perfect sense. Nobody's should be creating a product that they're like, I think this is going to be good. I think people are going to want yeah. this and then make the product and be like, Hey, who wants this? Right. Yeah. Right. When you could go to the people and say, Hey, what do you want? Right. And then make that. And this, this even takes the sense of urgency that we were talking about earlier on in this conversation to another level, because when you say just do it, you don't even have to have it yet. You could just have the idea, post on Facebook or Instagram or your social media and say, hey, I'm rolling out this new product. It's got this, this, and this. I'd love some feedback on it. What do you think? And then create your product from there. Now you have something to go off of and now you're actually creating something that people want. That's your first step. My, my nine-year-old had an idea. He goes, let's go ahead and sell these pop-it things to kids. I go, before we do that, let's see what happens. So he took two or three pop-its, 
he was able to sell them for like two bucks a pop or something like that for these little fidget thingies they do or whatever it may be. I said, okay, great. Now let's go on Amazon and see if we can find them wholesale. You know, you're able to find 50 of them for a dollar a piece or less than that, I think 50 cents a piece. Uh, and now we can sell them for a dollar, two dollars, whatever. And then he was off to the races. That's but even awesome. he, he tested. I mean, you test before you do it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, it, in our, I'm a health and fitness coach and we always say test don't guess too many people are just throwing shit at a wall and hoping it sticks. Oh, I'm going to yeah. work out. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to do keto. I'm going to you don't even know what you should be eating. Yeah. Like you, you should always test not guess. And that applies to pretty much everything. If you're looking to make an improvement, make a change, whatever it may be, always test first. But I want to talk about the Apple thing, because I think that is what screws more people up than anything else. All right. And I won't go into it too much, but guess what? There's only one Apple. And yeah, guess, you're not Steve Jobs. They, they were, you're not they Steve were, Jobs. They, they were at the beginning of the industry. All right. So they created a segment of that. And then you can say, well, Bill Gates was the opposite side and he made it more of a commoditized, you know, just analytical, whatever. So they were polarizing the side of the market. But what people don't talk about is there's hundreds of companies, if not more than that, all in between. Okay. So yeah, maybe you were this to get an apple, but the chances of you becoming an apple are basically one in how many ever companies there have ever been, uh, which is basically very low, but your chances of creating a company that's doing 10 million, that's doing 20 million, 50 million, 5 million is pretty damn high, extremely high. If you put the, the actual product and sales validation first, put the marketing first. Yeah. And Agreed. yeah, I mean, it's just, a, it's a great point because, you know, I think somebody like Steve Jobs is obviously, you know, um, many, you know, a, a genius or whatever, but also is just like got lucky being at the right time. And so like, you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to base your entire business plan and like millions of dollars of investor money based off of like hoping to hit a lottery ticket or whatever, yep. like. You know, I don't know. Doesn't that doesn't make sense to me? It's a fairy tale. It's a yeah. fairy tale. Yeah, but if you test, you collect data, you have something to go off of. You're just going to increase your chances of getting lucky. Yeah, but Josh, also I say this: F data. Put up an order form. Get a sale. It doesn't mean you have to take the sale. See if people buy the damn thing. And I don't yeah, mean yeah. your mom or your brother or your 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 nephew twice removed <laughs> or whatever. I mean a third party. You get a, and this is what I tell founders all the time: show me a sale. Just a sale, a sale. And they're always like, well, what's the next thing to do? I go, sales validate, get a damn sale. And that's what we send them out to do. That's what they end up doing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, you watch enough Shark Tank, you'll figure that out. They're always asking about sales <laughs> is, do people buy this product? And you always know, even if you know nothing about business, when the people are like, well, we haven't actually had any sales yet, that's not a good thing. You yeah. know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's man. Huge. This is a uh, man. This this could this time just like flew by in this conversation. I feel yeah, like, it's like we've been talking for five minutes. Um, well, man, this was uh, this was really eye opening, but also br bringing things down to like a really simple level that I think is going to be really helpful for a lot of people and and a helpful reminder for um, you know people who have been in business as well. But uh, Chris, before we take off, obviously we're going to want people to know where to find you. I'm going to definitely want to keep in touch with you as well. Sure. Um, sure. What about some some final words of wisdom to the people out here who either are looking to start a business because this is kind of your your bread and butter right now, uh, but are feeling a little bit stuck? What would you say to them? I have what are called the deal rules and deal rule 28 and deal rule 29 are quite possibly the most important. Okay. And I find myself saying these deal rules and almost every day, or if not weekly, whatever it may be, deal rule 28 is trust the process. So once you hop out on that road, you just go all the way. It's not something that you look behind you. You don't look over your shoulder. You just trust the process. Kind of like what we were talking about originally and deal rule 29 is I am enough. It doesn't mean that you know everything about everything. It doesn't mean that you have to do every damn role in a business. What it means is that you possess the intellect. You possess all the tools right now uh, that you need to go ahead and get started, even though you may not believe it, because you have a mind, because of where you are in this world right now. You, as a human being, have everything that you need. Don't doubt yourself. You are enough. I am enough. That's all you need to do and never give up. I love that. 
That's great. I love that. Yeah, that, that aligns very well with a lot of the other conversations that we have uh, surrounding just mental health, self-belief, self and, and just Definitely. a sense of self, things like that. Um, that's a good reminder for people to even just say to themselves every day. So I love that. That's a great way to end the podcast. So Chris, um, Dev, we're, we're going to want to keep in touch. We're going to want to follow you. I know our listeners are going to want to as well. This has been a phenomenal conversation. Uh, like I said, it just flew by. So where can we learn more about you? We know you have your LinkedIn. We'll put show notes, sure, uh, the sure. links in the show notes, but where can we find you? What do you got going on? You can find me easily at gusher.co, G-U-S-H-E-R.co, gusher.co. Everybody can find me there. I'm pretty easy to find out there. Awesome. Super simple. A man of one link. We like it. There you go. <laughs> so guys, we'll have that link in the show notes for you. I highly recommend you check out Chris uh, at gusher.co. And I'm, I'm sure we can access your LinkedIn and things like that from there to be able to keep in touch with you further. But Chris, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I really appreciate it. So thank you for coming on and sharing your expertise with us, man. This has been awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. I've enjoyed every last minute of it. Of course. All right. And thank you, everybody who's tuned into another episode of the Struggle to Strength podcast. Trust the process, know you're enough, get it done. We'll see you next week.